Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar co-produced by the CRISPR Journal and Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News. Our special guest today is Professor David Liu, who will be talking about precision genome editing without double strand breaks. Our thanks to Trilink Biotechnologies for sponsoring today's webcast. I'm your host, Kevin Davis, Executive Editor for the CRISPR Journal and the author of the book Editing Humanity, The CRISPR Revolution and the New Era of Genome Editing, which includes a chapter on the cool technologies you'll be hearing about in today's program. Our guest speaker today is Professor David Liu. A chemist by training, David's lab is the driving force behind the development of base editing and more recently prime editing. In addition to his prestigious academic titles shown here, he's also the co-founder of several gene editing companies, including Editas Medicine, Beam Therapeutics, and Prime Medicine. Following David's presentation, which will run for about 45 minutes, we'll also hear some remarks from Jessica Madigan. Jessica, also a chemist by training, has risen up the ranks of Trilink over the past decade to become their Director of Business Development. Before I hand over to David, please enter your questions for the Q&A session at the end of today's webcast. Simply hit the Ask a Question button at the top of the screen and submit. All right, let's get today's show underway. David, thank you so much for joining us. We are eagerly looking forward to your presentation. On behalf of a large team of students, postdocs, and collaborators, it's a pleasure to give this GEN webinar on precision gene editing without double-strand DNA breaks. I'll begin with a roadmap of four topics I'll cover in this talk. I'll start with an overview of base editing, a general and precise gene editing technology that does not require double-strand DNA breaks. Then I'll describe how a new class of base editors has enabled precision gene editing in an important part of the cell that cannot be edited with CRISPR. Third, I'll share newly published work that exemplifies how we can use base editing to treat a serious genetic disease in an animal. And finally, I'll present prime editing, a highly versatile new editing technology that can perform true search and replace gene editing in living systems. Human gene variants that cause genetic diseases come in many varieties. They include the transition point mutations, shown here in blue, which cause conditions such as progeria, the rapid aging disease. The transversion point mutations, represented by the red wedge of this pie chart, cause conditions including sickle cell disease. And small insertions and small deletions cause diseases such as Tay-Sachs disease and cystic fibrosis, respectively. A long-standing goal of the life sciences has therefore been to develop the ability to install or correct all types of pathogenic mutations so we can study or treat the broadest possible range of the resulting diseases. Programmable nucleases, such as zinc finger nucleases, talons, and CRISPR-Cas9, recognized by last year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry to Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, initiated the modern era of gene editing by enabling targeted gene disruption. For most genetic diseases, however, precise target gene correction rather than gene disruption is needed to benefit patients. Using programmable nucleases to precisely correct mutated genes in most therapeutic settings remains very challenging because in mammalian cells, the primary response to a double-strand DNA break is to initiate end-joining repair processes that result in uncontrolled mixtures of insertions and deletions collectively called indels, as well as other cellular responses such as chromosomal translocations or p53 activation. In the presence of a donor DNA template, seminal work from Maria Jason and others showed that a double-strand break can also stimulate homology-directed repair, or HDR. Unfortunately, the efficiency of HDR in most cell types as well as the challenges associated with donor DNA template delivery, 
have greatly limited the therapeutic relevance of HDR. As a result, as of February 2021, none of the 43 CRISPR clinical trials that were underway using programmable nucleases are trying to correct a pathogenic mutation. Instead, current therapeutic CRISPR clinical trials overwhelmingly are focused on the small fraction of targets for which gene disruption through indel formation can be therapeutic, such as the disruption of genes that silence fetal hemoglobin to treat blood disorders caused by mutations in adult hemoglobin genes. To provide one potential solution to this challenge, we developed base editors. Base editors use the targeting mechanism of programmable DNA binding proteins to engage a desired DNA sequence. But instead of cutting the DNA, they use deaminase enzymes from nature, or those evolved in our laboratory, to directly convert one target base into another. And then they guide the cell through DNA repair processes to make this conversion permanent on both DNA strands. Cytosine base editors convert C to T, or G to A, while adenine base editors convert A to G, or T to C. We reported the first base editors four years ago, which is ancient history by the standards of the genome editing field. So I'll only briefly summarize how we developed them. Cytosine base editors are fusions of three proteins. First, a catalytically impaired Cas9, shown in blue, which cannot cut the DNA double helix, but retains its ability to bind DNA in a guide RNA programmed manner. Second, a cytidine deaminase enzyme, shown in red, which catalyzes the hydrolytic deamination of cytosine to uracil in single-stranded DNA. And third, a uracil glycosylase inhibitor in purple, which protects the uracil from removal by the cell. In the presence of target DNA, the Cas9 domain opens up the target DNA site and pairs one DNA strand with the guide RNA. The unpaired DNA forms a single-stranded bubble within which all cytosines within about a five-base window are deaminated into uracil, creating a UG mispair. The uracil glycosylase inhibitor domain protects the uracil from base excision repair. To trick the cell into replacing the G on the opposite strand with an A, the most efficient base editors also nick the unedited G-containing strand, which stimulates the cell into remaking that strand using the uracil-containing strand as a template. The result is conversion of a targeted CG base pair into a UA or TA base pair. In our original report in 2016, we showed that BE1 the simple fusion of a dead Cas9 with a cytidine deaminase gave low but detectable editing efficiencies. BE2, which added the UGI domain, improved editing efficiency substantially. And BE3, which added the nicking feature to BE2, edited the most efficiently of the three original cytosine base editors. By converting targeted CG base pairs to TA, Cytosine base editors can correct up to 14% of known pathogenic mutations, shown here in blue. Correcting the lion's share of disease-associated point mutations, however, requires conversion of an AT base pair to a GC base pair, the opposite of what a cytosine base editor does. In 2017, we reported the development of an adenine base editor, which accomplishes this conversion. ABEs catalyze the hydrolytic deamination of adenosine, yielding inosine, which is read as G during transcription or DNA replication. So in principle, developing an ABE should be achievable simply by replacing the cytidine deaminase in BE3 with a deoxyadenosine deaminase. The ABE would open up target DNA, deaminate A to I, then nick the non-edited strand containing the T tricking the cell's mismatch machinery into replacing it with a C as it remakes that strand. The result would be conversion of an AT base pair to a GC. The big problem with this idea, however, is that there is no known natural enzyme that deaminates ad adenine in DNA. To overcome this problem, we used laboratory evolution to evolve 
the first enzyme that deaminates deoxyadenosine. We created a Darwinian selection system that rewards the deamination of adenine in DNA with the restoration of antibiotic resistance in bacteria, then made large libraries of mutant TAD-A tRNA deaminase genes. After seven consecutive rounds of mutation, selection, and characterization in mammalian cells, we succeeded in evolving ABE 7.10, which acquired 14 mutations that together allow it to deaminate DNA rather than tRNA, and that also generalize the enzyme's sequence tolerance to accept adenines in a wide variety of sequence contexts rather than the UAC context favored by the wild-type tRNA deaminase. The result was the first editing agent capable of installing targeted AT to GC edits in human cells. Base editing has proven quite general and can function efficiently even to edit post-mitotic primary cells in vitro and in vivo. Shown here is the use of an ABE or a CBE to edit post-mitotic primary cells in the inner ear at the top and primary cortical neurons in mice at the bottom. All possible types of off-target base editing have now been studied in depth and minimized for both CBEs and ABEs by labs including Keith Juns, Hui Yanes, Kaisha Gao's, Nicole Gadelli's, and our own. CAS-dependent off-target DNA editing arises from the fact that CAS proteins are not perfectly specific for their target DNA sequence and will occasionally bind sequences that are very similar but not identical to the target. CAS-independent off-target DNA editing and off-target RNA editing arise from the opportunity of deaminase enzymes, which natively process accessible DNA and RNA sequences, to continue to do so at a low level even when tethered to a programmable DNA binding protein. For all of these types of off-target base editing, CBE and ABE variants and delivery methods have been developed that greatly reduce off-target base editing, often down to background levels observed in untreated control cells. Importantly, the consequences of off-target base editing differ from those of off-target cleavage of DNA by nucleases. Off-target DNA cleavage in the same cell as on-target DNA cleavage results in multiple double-strand DNA breaks. Several laboratories, including those of Kathy Nyakin, David Pellman, Carl June, Paul Thomas, Jean Jun Li, and Alan Bradley, have shown that cellular double-strand breaks, especially multiple DNA cuts, promote large deletions, translocations, chromothripsis, and other chromosomal abnormalities. Off-target base editing, in contrast, results in multiple point mutations, and thus far has been shown by multiple labs, including Zhang Zhen Li's group, to not result in detected chromosomal rearrangements. Since their debut five years ago, base editors have been used by many laboratories in a variety of different organisms, ranging from bacteria to insects to plants to primates, resulting in hundreds of publications. AdGene, the nonprofit library for DNA blueprints, has sent our base editor constructs more than 10,000 times to fulfill requests from more than 3,000 laboratories around the world. We and other labs have greatly expanded the capabilities of base editors over the past few years. As one recent example, we used our Phage Assisted Continuous Evolution System, or PACE, to rapidly evolve new deoxyadenosine deaminases that greatly enhance ABE activity. From a PACE selection that requires an ABE to fix two premature stop codons in T7 polymerase in order to allow replication of phage encoding evolving ABE variants, we rapidly evolved ABE8E, a remarkably active base editor. In collaboration with Jennifer Doudna's group, we found that ABE8E is about 600 to 1100 times faster than previously reported ABE variants such as ABE7.10. ABE8E's higher activity enables base editing levels in well-transfected cells to approach 100%.
A three-way collaboration with Jennifer's lab and Peter Beal's group revealed the beautiful cryo-EM structure of ABE8E, showing in molecular detail how the enzyme has evolved to accept DNA and to acquire much faster kinetics. We have also used the PACE system to rapidly evolve the other domain of base editors, the CRISPR-Cas domain, to be able to target previously inaccessible PAM sequences, thereby expanding the targeting scope of base editors. Base editors are especially PAM dependent because their precision arises from a small editing window, canonically about five nucleotides wide, within which the target nucleotide must be positioned. This requirement means that for canonical base editors, a PAM must exist approximately 15 plus or minus two bases from the target nucleotide. Limiting the PAMs for base editing to the NGG PAM of SPCAS9 means only about one quarter of all known pathogenic transition point mutations can be connect corrected by base editing. Using a PACE circuit that selects SPCAS9 mutants that can bind PAMs of our choosing, we evolved new Cas9 variants that can recognize PAM sequences other than NGG. Using this PACE system, we evolved three new families of Cas9 variants through hundreds of generations of evolution that collectively recognize the vast majority of NR PAM space where R is an A or a G. Together, these PAM variants in principle allow about 95% of known pathogenic transition point mutations to now be installed or corrected with an ABE or a CBE. Integrating ABE8E with the new NR PAM CAS variants enables editing efficiencies and precise allele access that were really not possible before. For example, fine-tuning the positioning of an ABE8E with an evolved CACC PAM variant enabled us, in collaboration with Mitch Weiss's lab, to achieve more than 80% correction of the hemoglobin mutation that is the most common cause of sickle cell disease into a non-pathogenic variant called hemoglobin Macassar in primary human CD34-positive cells from a sickle cell patient, and this editing was done with minimal indels. This level of editing performance has exciting clinical applications for the treatment of globinopathies. Hundreds of cytosine and adenine base editors have now been published that collectively use more than 70 deaminases, more than 40 Cas protein variants, and more than 25 different architectures. This dizzying array of base editor choices, coupled with the lack of a systematic and comprehensive understanding of base editor characteristics, can make it difficult to choose the best base editor to, to achieve a desired edit. To begin to address this issue, we recently reported a machine learning model trained on experimental data from editing each of 38,000 genetically integrated target sites with each of 11 different CBEs and ABEs. We used the resulting treasure trove of data, a tiny summary of which is shown on the left, to train machine learning models that accurately predict base editing efficiency and product distributions for the most commonly used base editors. We call the resulting suite of machine learning models Beehive, and here you can see predicted versus experimentally observed editing efficiencies of using four different base editors to correct to wild type 7 to 10,000 pathogenic point mutations. A public website that allows researchers to easily use Beehive, crisperbeehive.design, is now live. It allows you to simply paste in a genomic DNA sequence, the guide RNA target sequence you propose to use, and one of 11 CBE or AB variants, and then will output the predicted editing efficiencies with an estimated abundance for each genotype and we'll also translate protein coding gene products so you can easily see how each base editor is predicted to change the sequence of your gene and protein. One of the few important regions of biological DNA space that's thus far untouched by precision genome editing is mitochondrial DNA. Mutations in 
mitochondrial DNA cause many genetic diseases and collectively affect about 1 in 5,000 people. The vast majority of pathogenic mitochondrial DNA mutations are transition point mutations that in principle could be installed or corrected with a cytosine or adenine base editor. However, CRISPR has not been successfully used in the mitochondria for the simple reason that no mechanisms to transport guide RNAs into mitochondria are known. Perhaps because in mammalian cells, the mitochondrial genome is thought to contain all of the small RNAs needed for mitochondrial DNA gene expression. As a result, the only form of targeted mitochondrial DNA manipulation reported to date is targeted mitochondrial DNA destruction, which can be achieved with RNA-free programmable nucleases, such as zinc finger nucleases or talons. In a three-way collaboration with Joseph Mogus's lab and Vamsi Mutha's lab, we recently developed the first precision editing capability for mitochondrial DNA. Joseph Mogus's lab discovered an interbacterial toxin called DDDA that is predicted to be a cytidine deaminase. But when they characterized the toxin biochemically, they found that it does not deaminate single-stranded DNA or RNA like all previously described cytidine deaminases. But instead, it de deaminates cytosines in double-stranded DNA. This unique ability of DDDA deaminase to operate on double-stranded DNA raises the possibility that we might be able to develop CRISPR-free all protein base editors that could enable the first precision editing of mitochondrial DNA. Whereas all previous CBEs and ABEs deaminate single-stranded DNA and therefore require CRISPR to generate a single-stranded DNA bubble at the target site, the ability of DDDA to deaminate double-stranded DNA raises the possibility of using programmable DNA binding proteins such as zinc finger arrays or tail arrays to engage target DNA and recruit a fused DDDA to the target site without requiring a CRISPR protein or any guide RNA. To summarize Alon's story, we made non-toxic versions of this highly toxic protein by splitting it into two pieces, then linked each half of split DDDA to a tail repeat array programmed to bind adjacent DNA sequences either in the nucleus or in the mitochondria. After answering many questions that defined an optimal CRISPR-free base editor architecture, we identified the one shown here as enabling efficient targeted conversion of CG base pairs to TA base pairs in mitochondria or in nuclei. The optimized DDCBE, as we call it, consists of a mitochondrial targeting sequence followed by a tail repeat array, a short linker, one half of the DDDA deaminase toxin, and one UGI domain. A complete DDCBE consists of two such proteins, which together assemble on target DNA to bring together two inactive halves of DDDA into an active deaminase, triggered by the high effective molarity of each half when bound to adjacent DNA sites. DDCBEs can base edit nuclear DNA efficiently if you replace the mitochondrial targeting sequence with a nuclear localization sequence. In mitochondria, DDCBEs edit very cleanly with no detectable indels, probably due to a lack of double-strand break repair pathways in mitochondria. Treating human cells with these DDCBEs showed that we could efficiently ins use them to install CG to TA point mutations for the first time at a variety of mitochondrial DNA sites, with 5 to 50% efficiency depending on the site, on the position of the C within the editing window between the tail binding sites, and on the orientation of the fusion proteins. Once again, we observed no detectable indel byproducts from base editing in the mitochondria at any of these sites. We assessed off-target editing by these new CRISPR-free mitochondrial base editors by sequencing at a very high depth the entire mitochondrial genome in treated or control cells. We found that off-target editing was quite low in general, with substantial off-target editing observed for only one variant, shown in the red bar here, which used a known N-terminal tail domain 
that binds DNA promiscuously. But for the other DDCBEs, ratios of on-target editing to off-target editing were very high. DDCBEs can be used to model pathogenic mitochondrial DNA mutations in mammalian cells, which could be especially useful to generate or correct cell or animal models of mitochondrial genetic diseases. For example, we showed that these new base editors can install a known pathogenic mutation in ND4, a mitochondrial gene that encodes part of complex 1, the first enzyme in the electron transport chain of aerobic respiration. Installing this mutation using DDCBE indeed lowers oxidative phosphorylation and respiration rates and also selectively lowers complex 1 abundance and activity, but not those of other complexes in the electron transport chain. Our lab and others have begun to use base editors to address animal models of human genetic diseases. In an exciting collaboration with the labs of Francis Collins, Mike Erdos, Jonathan Brown, Ken Cow, Charles Lynn, and Leslie Gordon, we sought to use an adenine base editor to directly reverse back to wild type the mutation that causes the rapid aging disease progeria. In 90% of progeria patients, a single C to T mutation in one copy of Lamin A creates an early splice site in an exon that results in the loss of 50 amino acids of coding sequence that includes a proteolytic cleavage site. The resulting progerin protein remains farnesylated, damages nuclear membranes, and causes early death around 14 years of age, typically from cardiovascular failure. Despite a very passionate community of patients and researchers who have attacked this disease using many approaches, including a recently approved farnesyl transferase small molecule inhibitor, current therapies have not yet greatly extended patient lifespan. Because this mutation is dominant, gene complementation to add additional copies of wild-type lamin A does not rescue progeria, and even approaches to use nucleases to disrupt the mutated allele are challenged by the fact that the mutation differs from the healthy copy of the allele by only a single base pair and occurs at a cryptic splice site that makes the effects of uncontrolled indel byproducts, which result from double-strand breaks, difficult to predict. We envisioned using an adenine base editor to directly correct back to wild type the lamin A mutation that causes progeria. We used lentivirus to deliver ABE 7.10, targeted with an engineered PAM-Cas9 variant developed by Keith Jun's lab, to correct fibroblasts from two progeria patients, and observed about 90% correction back to wild-type lamin A with minimal indels. Compared to untreated cells, we observed a significant reduction in the amount of misspliced progerin transcript among treated cells, as well as a large reduction in the presence of the toxic progerin protein in treated cells, which now show a lamin western blot that resembles samples from their unaffected parent. And both the presence of progerin and the characteristic blebbing of the nuclear envelope are rescued in the treated patient fibroblasts. To assess potential off-target DNA editing from the guide RNA and Cas9 variant used to correct the causative mutation in the patient-derived cells, we used Keith Jun's CircleSeq method, which is a highly sensitive way of identifying the DNA sites that are engaged by a specific Cas9 protein and guide RNA. We amplified from the genomic DNA of ABE-treated cells the top 32 candidate off-target sites identified by the CircleSeq method and found that none of them showed off-target editing levels above our detection threshold of 0.1%. We also performed transcriptome-wide off-target RNA editing analysis and observed no significant increase in average A to I editing levels among cellular RNAs. These results with cultured patient cells were sufficiently encouraging that we initiated a series of long-term animal studies in collaboration with Francis Collins and Mike Erdos at NIH and Jonathan Brown at Vanderbilt. Since base editors are currently too large to fit into a single AAV vector, we divided the base editors into two proteins, 
each fused to a protein splicing transintein and packaged each half into separate AAV9 capsids. We then injected the mouse model of human progeria developed by Francis Collins's lab, which contains two copies of the mutated human lamin gene with 10 to the 11th to 10 to the 12th total viral genomes per mouse. That is 5 times 10 to the 10th to 5 times 10 to the 11th of each AAV9, either 3 or 14 days after birth. We were pleased to see that a single systemic retroorbital injection of ABE AAV resulted in substantial editing of a variety of organs, including the aorta, which often fails as a proximal cause of death in progeria human patients. Indeed, we observed about 25% correction of the mutation in the aorta of P14 injected mice at six months, and about half as much editing in the aorta for the P3 injected mice. This DNA correction was accompanied by few indel byproducts, an advantage of avoiding double-stranded DNA breaks. At the RNA and protein levels, we observed an apparent amplification of this correction with a dramatic reduction of progerin transcripts and progerin protein levels in most tissues, including the heart. That 25% correction at the DNA level could lead to more substantial correction at the RNA and protein levels suggests that corrected cells may be more active or may be able to replace uncorrected cells in some tissues. We were especially excited when we performed histological studies on the treated mice. A wild-type mouse at six months of age shows a healthy aorta cross-section shown here with plenty of smooth muscle nuclei, which appear as purple dots in the upper image, and relatively little adventitia the stiff tissue that shows up as beige that accumulates around the aorta in progeria mice and in human patients. Now, if you look at a saline injected progeria mouse, you see about a tenfold average loss of smooth muscle cells and the formation of a thick adventitial layer surrounding the aorta. But the P14 injected ABE treated progeria mice show almost wild type like smooth muscle cell counts and very little adventitia. The P3 injected mice, which were edited in the aorta half as efficiently as the P14 injected mice, showed an intermediate phenotype. We used immunofluorescence to visualize both progerin, shown in green, and wild type human lamin, shown in red, in aortal tissue from wild-type C57 black mice, from control progeria mice injected with saline at P14, and from progeria mice injected with ABE AAV at P14. Wild-type C57 black mice show no human lamin protein and no progerin as expected. You can see that on the left. Tissue from progeria mice that are only 28 days old before smooth muscle cells are lost show smooth muscle nuclei with correctly spliced human lamin protein and with progerin protein in green, as expected, because these young progeria mice contain two copies of the mutated human progerin gene. At six months of age, the saline-injected progeria mice have now lost the vast majority of their vascular smooth muscle cells, as expected. But remarkably, at the same six months of age, the ABE AAV injected progeria mice show plenty of vascular smooth muscle cells with human lamin, but very few of them contain progerin. These results demonstrate that in vivo correction of the causative human progeria mutation in mice greatly reduces the level of progerin in aortal vascular smooth muscle cells and instead corrects the progeria mutation to allow these cells to express corrected human lamin. We also performed a longevity study on treated and controlled progeria mice. The lifespan of the less well-edited P3 injected cohort was 1.8 fold longer than their saline injected counterparts. And remarkably, the better edited P14 injected cohort reached a median lifespan of 510 days, which corresponds to the beginning of old age in wild type normal C57 black mice 
and represents approximately a two and a half fold longer lifespan. To our knowledge, this degree of median lifespan extension in an animal model of progeria has never before been achieved. Beyond Kaplan-Meier curves, the preservation of general animal vitality among the treated mice is remarkable. The untreated progeria mice live only about seven months old, by which time the mice have thinned and whitened coats, pronounced kyphosis or outward curvature of the spine, and very low activity levels, as you can see here. Now here is a video of three P14 injected ABE treated females at 11 months old, so far older than any untreated progeria mice can survive. Kyphosis is not pronounced and activity levels are very high. And here are three P14 injected ABE treated males plus one wild type C57 black mouse for comparison, which is the slightly larger mouse. And again, you can see that they have healthy coats, no obvious kyphosis, and high activity levels. We're hopeful that these results collectively provide a foundation to bring to patients the benefits from directly correcting the mutation that causes progeria. And we're currently working with our collaborators in coordination with scientists at NIH and Beam Therapeutics to do so. So base editors can correct pathogenic transition mutations in vitro and in vivo, in some cases with dramatic rescue of disease phenotype. But what about the other pathogenic mutations beyond transition point mutations? Since these other mutations account for 70% of known pathogenic gene variants, we sought to develop other methods to directly install or correct transversions, deletions, or insertions without requiring double-stranded DNA breaks or donor DNA templates. At the end of 2019, we reported prime editing, a new mammalian cell gene editing technology to achieve these goals. Prime editors are fusions of Cas nickases with engineered reverse transcriptases. They use an engineered prime editing guide RNA, or PEG RNA for short, which not only specifies the target site for editing, but also encodes the desired edit. Prime editors nick the target DNA site, then use the three prime end of the freshly nicked DNA strand to prime reverse transcription of an extension on the PEG RNA that serves as a reverse transcriptase template. The engineered reverse transcriptase domain of the prime editor then copies the desired edit directly onto the target DNA strand, creating a three prime flap that the cell resolves into a heteroduplex containing one edited and one unedited strand. The PE3 system then nicks the non-edited strand to cause the cell to remake the strand using the edited strand as a template thereby completing the editing of both DNA strands. Since the RT template of the PEG RNA is specified entirely by the researcher, one can make virtually any small substitution, insertion, or deletion using this strategy. PE3 shows remarkable versatility in the types of edits that can now be directly installed in DNA in human cells. Shown here are all 24 possible single base substitutions that we made in a stretch of eight consecutive DNA base pairs in the human genome. Indeed, we can use prime editing to perform targeted transversions, deletions, insertions, and combinations thereof for the first time without requiring double strand breaks or donor DNA templates. While the data in the previous slide was from HEC 293T cells, the cells in which we developed prime editing, other cell types, even including postmitotic primary cortical neurons, can also support prime editing, albeit with varying efficiencies that are generally lower than that of HEC293T cells. In collaboration with Britt Adamson's lab at Princeton, we recently performed a large-scale screen to identify cellular determinants of prime editing efficiencies with some exciting new insights and improved prime editing systems that we hope to report soon. Previous CRISPR-based editing methods derived DNA specificity primarily from the single DNA 
guide RNA hybridization event. In contrast, prime editing requires three such hybridization events in order for prime editing to take place productively. First, hybridization of the PEG RNA to the target DNA site. Second, hybridization of the freshly nicked target DNA strand to the primer binding site of the PEG RNA. And third, hybridization of the reverse transcribed 3' flap onto the unedited strand of DNA. Since each of these three hybridization events presents an opportunity for an off-target sequence to be rejected, we speculated that prime editing might offer lower editing levels at off-target DNA sites than Cas9 nuclease. To test this possibility, we examined 16 of the most notorious off-target sites in the human genome of four on-target guide RNAs, including the hex site 4 off-target number 3 that is consistently edited even more efficiently than the on-target site. A side-by-side -side comparison of editing efficiencies of Cas9 nuclease compared with the prime editors at these 16 off-target sites, using the same PEG RNAs to program both the nuclease and the prime editors, revealed that prime editing efficiencies at these off-target sites were indeed lower in every case than with Cas9 nuclease. In fact, only one of the 16 off-target sites we examined, the notorious HEC site 4 off-target number 3, showed more than 1% off-target editing. And in this case, choosing a PEG RNA that minimizes 3' flap homology with the off-target site greatly reduced off-target editing back down to only 0.2%. As you have probably gathered from all the data I've presented, base editing and prime editing offer complementary strengths. Base editors have been relentlessly studied and optimized for four years now, and have been used in hundreds of publications. They currently offer higher editing efficiencies and lower indel levels than prime editors, at least at target sites that are well suited for base editing. When the target nucleotide does not lie within the base editing window, however, such as C3 shown here, then prime editors offer higher efficiencies than base editors. And because prime editors are immune to bystander editing, they have little difficulty editing, for example, the first and third of a string of three consecutive C's, whereas base editors will edit all the C's or all the A's within the roughly four or five nucleotide wide base editing window. So base editors offer higher efficiency and fewer indels, while prime editors offer greater versatility, precision, and targeting scope. We've started to use prime editing to install or correct a variety of pathogenic mutations. We can efficiently generate homozygous sickle cell mutant cell lines using prime editing and correct such a cell line by replacing the T that causes most sickle cell disease with a wild type A. Likewise, we can generate with PE3 a homozygous cell line that contains the four base insertion that causes most cases of Tay-Sachs disease, then correct these cells back to wild type using PE3. We can also install a protective transversion mutation that makes mice and humans resistant to prion disease. And we can insert epitope tags and recombination sites into targeted locations in the human genome for biotechnology applications. Even though we reported prime editing shortly before the pandemic slowed down or shut down many research groups, including our own, it has been terrific to see prime editing already result in dozens of publications and preprints in a variety of cell types and organisms, including crop plants, organoids, mouse embryos, and postnatal mice. AdGene has distributed our prime editor constructs to fulfill requests from more than 1,000 laboratories around the world. To summarize, base editing enables the four transition point mutations to be installed at targeted sites without double-strand breaks or donor DNA templates, and has been advanced through the work of many labs to include developments such as CRISPR-free base editors that enable the first precision editing of mitochondrial DNA in living cells. Base editing coupled with in vivo delivery systems such as the AAV system I described can correct animal models of human genetic diseases. A single injection 
of ABE AAV into progeria mice rescued the disease at the DNA, RNA, protein, nuclear morphology, aortal histology, lifespan, and animal vitality levels. And prime editing, while much newer than base editing, establishes how a NICT target DNA site can directly prime DNA polymerization to introduce a wide range of edits into human cells, again, without requiring double-strand breaks or donor DNA. Even just five years ago, the prospect of engineering molecular machines that correct a specific DNA-based pair in an animal that causes a devastating genetic disease to alleviate some of the consequences of the disease really seemed like science fiction. So I'm very grateful to a highly talented and dedicated group of students, postdocs, and collaborators who made this work possible. Andrew Anzalone, now at Prime Medicine, led the development of Prime Editing. Monda Arbab and Max Shen led the development of the Beehive machine learning model that predicts base editing outcomes. Jordan Doman and Aditya Raghuram led the study and development of base editors that show lower off-target editing. Nicole Gadelli, now at Beam Therapeutics, developed the first editing base editor. Luke Koblen, in collaboration with the labs of Francis Collins, Mike Erdos, Jonathan Brown, Leslie Gordon, and others, led our progeria study. Alexis Comor, now a professor at UCSD, developed the first base editor, the CBE. John Levy and Ariel Ye developed the base editing AAV system. Beverly Mock, in collaboration with researchers from Joseph Mogus's lab and Vamsi Mutha's lab, led the mitochondrial base editing project. Shannon Miller and Tina Wand, now a professor at the University of Wisconsin, evolved the NRPAM Cas9 variants. Michelle Richter and Kevin Zhao evolved ABE8E, and in collaboration with the labs of Jennifer Dowden and Peter Beale, characterized this new adenine base editor. Finally, I'm grateful for all of these agencies for their funding, for Trilink for providing reagents, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. That was a brilliant presentation. And thank you also for staying around for our Q&A discussion, which will begin shortly. A reminder to everyone, please submit your questions for David into the Q&A box and we'll get to those in a minute. Before that, I'd now like to welcome Trilink's Jessica Madigan, who will give a short presentation. Hi, Jessica. Thank you to Dr. Liu and to Jen for giving me the opportunity to present today. I'm Jessica Madigan, Director of Business Development at Trilink Biotechnologies. Trilink is a CDMO CMO that specializes in manufacturing of modified nucleic acids. We offer research, preclinical, and clinical grades. I have about five minutes today to give you a quick overview of the advantages of mRNA for mediating efficient editing. These are our forward-looking statements. So what are the benefits of using mRNA to express base editors? By using mRNA, you can benefit from increased specificity due to transient expression. mRNA only needs to be delivered to the cytoplasm. While direct delivery of the RNP complex may sound like the most straightforward option, Delivering a large protein across a cell membrane can be extremely challenging, and mRNA has been shown to be more efficient than plasmids. On the left is a visual representation of delivery of the three different approaches. While delivery of a protein has shown to result in rapid onset of gene editing, it must be delivered across two cellular barriers, the cell membrane and the nuclear membrane. Delivery of DNA must also cross two cellular barriers. Additionally, DNA gene must undergo transcription and translation before editing. mRNA only needs to be delivered to the cytoplasm. After translation occurs, the protein is shuttled into the nucleus by the nuclear localization signals and can now edit targeted DNA. On the right is the editing comparison of cells treated with base editor plasmid DNA, mRNA, or protein. At one genomic locus in HEK293T cells and their on and off-target editing ratios. In this set of experiments, mRNA yielded the best editing efficiency. Now, when planning to manufacture an mRNA, the important considerations for an ideal base editor include CAP1 structure, low immune stimulation, optimization of untranslated regions, 
and a poly A tail of 80 bases or longer. Cap 1. At Trilink, we developed a co-transcriptional cap analog called ClinCap. It offers improvements over legacy capping technologies as it yields a natural Cap 1 structure. Traditional capping analogs yield a Cap 0 structure. Cap structures are important in self-non-self recognition. Cap 1 structures are found in higher eukaryotic messages. While Cap 0 is sufficient for ribosomal recruitment, it can activate the immune system. Cap 1 methylation reduces binding to pattern recognition receptors. And IFITS recognizes non-methylated caps and sequesters them from the translational machinery. Additionally, CAP1 structures are more resistant to decapping enzymes, which results in longer persistence of mRNA in vivo and greater protein translation. ClinCap initiates transcription with a trimer nucleotide as shown here. The structure consists of an N7-methylguanosine followed by two bases that are complementary to the first two bases of the mRNA transcript. Another benefit of ClinCap is increased yield from the manufacturing process. ClinCap yields more than three times that of ARCA or MCAP. As demonstrated by this capping efficiency assay, clean cap results in greater than 95% capped product. A major contaminant of in vitro transcription reaction is double-stranded RNA, an unwanted byproduct and highly immune stimulatory. Modifications of mRNA with pseudo-U, N1-methyl-pseudo-U, or 5-methoxy-U have been shown to reduce binding to innate immune sensors in vitro. They also reduce toxicity and prolong expression. It is important to note that when using modified nucleotides, it is recommended to codon optimize the open reading frame to deplete for uridine content. Uridine depleted 5-methoxy-U modified RNAs give higher expression than wild type in cultured cells. In this experiment, adenine-based editor mRNAs are compared, wild type without codon optimization, wild type with codon optimization, and 5-methoxy-U modified with codon optimization. Cas9 mRNA served as a control. Five micrograms of mRNA was transfected. The adenine base editor mRNA with both 5 methoxyuridine modification and uridine depletion showed the highest protein expression in HEK293 T cells by Western blot. I wanted to spend a slide on considerations for guide RNA. Trilink's reputation is built on our expertise in synthesizing difficult, long, and unusual constructs containing extensive modifications. Trilink custom manufactures high quality guide RNAs for research and GMP. We offer single guide RNAs commonly used for CRISPR gene editing. And we also offer prime editing guide RNAs, which are substantially longer than the standard CRISPR guides. The users design and customize their sequence for editing. Trilink can introduce various modifications through chemical synthesis and our scales range from five micromoles to five millimoles. In conclusion, expression of base editors from mRNA is more efficient than plasmid or RNP. ClinCap, a co-transcriptional CAP analog mimics a CAP1 structure and is the superior capping technology. Uridine depletion and modified RNAs are used for maximal base editing expression, and Trilink can be your single source for mRNA and guide strands. I'd like to acknowledge the contributors to these slides and thank you for your help. And thank you for your attention today. Please contact our team to discuss your base editing manufacturing needs. Thank you very much, Jessica. Please submit your questions for our Q&A session, which is about to start. Uh, a reminder also that we will be archiving today's webinar so you can view it on demand or share it with colleagues. All right, time to address a few questions. Uh, just give us a couple of moments to transition into our live Q&A session. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, Kevin Davis back with you, uh, joined by David Liu and Jessica Madigan is also with us. Uh, so we have about 20 minutes, uh, I hope, for questions. And thank you for, for all your questions. They've been absolutely flooding in. Um, and that's because we have more than 2,500 people who signed up for today's webinar, and a good fraction of that uh, are on the call. Uh, as David noted before we began, that's five times the capacity crowd at a Cold Spring Harbor conference. So thank you, everybody. Um, uh, David, first off, uh, before we turn to the audience questions, it's been a great week for you. Congratulations on your election to the National Academy of Sciences. What does that distinction mean to you? Thank you. Well, I think the, the National Academy um, 
is a is a special honor because of course it's election by um, by scientific peers. <laughs> so that's yeah. uh, why it's especially uh, meaningful. Um, it, it's you know really uh, like I think any recognition of our work. It just reminds me how uh, fortunate I am to to have the opportunity to work with so many um, incredibly hardworking and and talented uh, students and postdocs, collaborators, yeah. and colleagues. Um, so yeah. really, it's an award that I think comments more on their uh, achievements and online. Very generous of you. All right, let's dive in. We have uh, more questions than we will possibly be able to get to, but let's do our best. Um, Ven Gopal uh, asked, does the chromatin structure or epigenetic changes, such as methylation, obviously, interfere with base editing? And are the latest versions of your base editing plasmids available for research? Uh, yes, so the last part is the easiest to answer. Um, we generally uh, deposit everything that we publish that we think could be useful to people to AdGene, as long as AdGene allows uh, that kind of material to be distributed. <laughs> so they won't distribute bacteriophage, uh, for example, but they, they will distribute plasmids. Um, so uh, we, we try to deposit in advance so that by the time it works its way through AdGene's uh, Quality control process and resequencing uh, that that it's roughly coincident with when the papers are released. Sometimes uh, we get it right, and sometimes it's a little bit uh, delayed. But everything should be available uh, from AdGene that's been published. That's sort of of primary use. And certainly, if you're having a hard time getting materials, you can uh, you can let me know. Um, and then with respect to chromatin, uh, I think a, a universal feature of uh, or aspect of all gene editing agents is that they uh, can be sensitive to the chromatin state of the target sequence. So uh, I'd say there are some both published and unpublished data uh, showing that highly chromatinized uh, targets can uh, uh, really suffer in terms of their editing efficiency. Uh, so this is a problem that's been noted by a number of labs, in, in, including our own. Um, and it's just something to, to keep an eye on. I'm, I'm actually somewhat surprised that uh, at least certain uh, gene editing agents, including many of the Cas9 variants that are commonly used, seem to have the ability to access even uh, partially chromatinized um, target sites. Uh, that is, editing efficiencies uh, are usually not uh, too bad, even if uh, the target, according to, say, a taxi data, uh, is you know moderately chromatinized, uh, but I think that is an, an opportunity for uh, for future improvement and development and understanding uh, for all these classes of gene editing agents. And then in terms of methylation state, the the third question, which is I guess the second question asked, um, uh, different deaminases will uh, accept or that is will tolerate or not tolerate uh, methylated bases to different extents, and uh, I think. An overall survey of the dozens of different deaminases that have now been used in base editors suggests that the uh, the few studies that have explicitly looked at different rates of methylation versus methylated versus unmethylated base editing uh, uh, that that the methylation preferences of the deaminases seem to be reflected in the methylation tolerances of the resulting base editors. Great, thank you, David. Uh, let's move on to another question. John is from Editas, a company, of course, you know quite well. Uh, the field has now seen CRISPR editing, base editing, and prime editing reduced to practice in cell culture and animal models across many laboratories. What are your thoughts, David, on the potential for CRISPR-guided transposases uh, and recombinases to be added to the gene editing toolbox in the near future? Why do you think that these have been harder to reduce to practice in eukaryotic cells to date? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, John, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, was a former postdoc in my lab. <laughs> good question, John. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, you know, our, our lab and, and others have, have tried to make uh, CRISPR recombinases, and we were partially successful. We reported a system we called RecCas9, where Basically, a dead Cas9 was uh, fused to an engineer 
uh, gin beta recombinase that uh, Carlos Barbas's lab developed. Uh, and it, it showed uh, gut RNA dependence and, and some programmability, but the recombinase module we used um, uh, still retains a fair amount of sequence requirement. And I think that's one uh, of the limitations behind uh, efforts to make fully reprogrammable recombinases is there isn't a generic recombinase domain that in a modular manner, to my knowledge, can be uh, redirected mm -hmm. fully by a programmable DNA binding domain. The transposate systems are, are really interesting. Um, some of their performances in, in bacteria have been uh, uh, just awesome to see. Uh, these are systems that uh, my colleague Fanjan developed and a different system that uh, Sam Sternberg at, at Columbia yeah. developed. Uh, and they each have, have unique strengths. Uh, they, as the question implies, I think have not, it, it has not yet been reported at least, uh, uh, data showing that those systems can work in mammalian cells. But I know many, many labs uh, are interested in in that possibility, and uh, and all I can say is, you know, it's, it's hard to bet against this field. So, I would hope yeah. and expect that in the coming years we will see uh, some translation of of those systems into mammalian cells. Indeed, Jason asks, have you validated the absence of double-stranded breaks using single-cell sequencing? Um, I'm not quite sure what the question is asking, but uh, there are a number of, of metrics one can use to uh, assess the presence of double-stranded breaks. Um, uh, there are methods, of course, that can intercept the double-stranded breaks, either in vitro or uh, in cells or even in vivo, uh, and then uh, sequence, attach tags to those double-stranded breaks and sequence them. A variety of, of uh, researchers have used those methods to characterize CRISPR nucleases, talons, zinc finger nucleases, and also to check uh, frequencies of double-stranded breaks from various forms of base editors. And, uh, and I think in unpublished work, at least some of those methods have been used in, uh, to characterize prime editors uh, with uh, the expected uh, outcomes. Uh, you know, double-stranded breaks uh, uh, are rare, but uh, uh, but measurable occurrences uh, in, in native cells and organisms. So uh, there isn't going to be a native biological system that is completely free of double-stranded breaks, at least so long as there's cosmic rays and you know, rocks and other sources of ionizing radiation, uh, as well as other sources of DNA damage that can lead to double-stranded breaks. But I think the, the main upside of, of uh, these methods that don't require making double-stranded breaks is you can really minimize the frequency of additional double-strand breaks that you're uh, adding to the genome, uh, recognizing that the presence of double-stranded breaks uh, leads to these uncontrolled mixtures of products, uh, uh, namely indels, which can be very useful if you're trying to disrupt a gene, uh, but can be undesired if you're trying to generate a homogeneous genotype uh, instead of a mixture of products after editing or if you're trying to do the kinds of precise corrections that, uh, that I showed in my talk. Right. Well, there is, it's, a, it's a bit of a tough crowd out there, David, because Ali asks, where do you see the next breakthrough in gene editing? As if he's, uh, I'm guessing so he is uh, <laughs> unimpressed with everything that you've presented uh, over the last 50 minutes. Uh, will yeah. it be a smaller Cas enzyme or a new delivery system, perhaps? What's up? Yeah. I mean, there are lots of directions uh, that the field still needs to go to fully realize the, you know, incredible potential both for basic science and for therapeutics of, of gene editing. It is, it, Hollywood, you know, used to uh, teach people incorrectly, I think since the 1980s, that we can sort of make arbitrary changes in DNA uh, in living organisms. Of course, that hasn't been true until somewhat recently, but even now we can't quite make every possible change we'd like to make in any type of cell, in any type of, of organism, especially in vivo. Uh, so there are still, there are still many uh, opportunities and, and I'd say important advances that are needed to 
uh, really achieve that goal of being able to make any kind of change in any kind of, of tissue in a living animal or in a human patient, prospectively. Um, you know, certainly delivery is a, is a very common answer to this type of question for a good reason. Mm -hmm. it, it is a bottleneck through which uh, many gene editing applications must pass. Uh, and I'd say, uh, as, as John's question in, uh, already implied, uh, the insertion of gene-sized fragments into targeted sites in uh, the human genome uh, uh, would be incredibly useful, both uh, for basic science, for biotechnology, and uh, for therapeutics. Uh, that's in part why there's so much interest in these transposases. There was news uh, this morning, David, you may have seen um, of uh, uh, in a clinical trial using for traditional gene therapy, not uh, not a gene editing method, but an adverse, um, a serious adverse event resulting presumably, but I don't know if it's proven, from AAV delivery. AAV, you touched on delivery methods incorporating AAV, typically thought to be a very safe uh, viral vector. Do you, are you uh, or is the field uh, actively looking at non-viral delivery systems for base and prime editors? Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I'd say that mRNA delivery, um, RNP delivery, that is delivering the protein RNA complexes, uh, those are, when possible, always preferred because the DNA specificity is maximized that way. That is, the off-target editing is minimized simply because those agents don't last long in the cell and the on targets tend to be edited uh, much faster than the off targets. Uh, viral delivery can be very useful, AAV in particular, because it's, uh, it remains one of the most efficacious ways to access certain cell types, at least without using integrating uh, viruses or viruses that are more prone to integration. But mm -hmm. whenever you introduce uh, DNA into cells, uh, there is a possibility of DNA integration. Uh, that mm -hmm. integration in, in rare events can occur at, at sites that might lead to adverse effects. Uh, you know, so certainly I think all of the things being equal, you would rather uh, use a non-viral method than a viral method. But unfortunately, the landscape is not uh, equal. You can't, uh, you, there, there are trade-offs with any delivery method. Uh, and therefore, I think AAV is going to remain an important uh, therapeutic in vivo delivery method for uh, macromolecular agents, including gene editing agents, uh, for some time. But the AAV space uh, and the viral vector delivery method space in general is advancing. Uh, and in fact, I'd say it's advancing at an accelerating pace, much like uh, the gene editing field has been advancing recently. Um, so, uh, you know, the work of, of uh, lots of researchers, including uh, Luke Vandenberg and, uh, and the folks at, at Voyager, uh, ben Deverman um, are in, constantly improving, uh, and I'd say making more safe these uh, these AAV vectors, and then a number of creative twists on viral vectors, including novel viruses and novel ways of using viruses, are also starting to to surface that uh, have me quite excited about uh, the future of delivery. Great. Uh, actually, this plays in very nicely to our next question. We received a couple of questions about your progeria uh, 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 portion of the presentation. Patrick Harrison is in Ireland. Hi, Patrick. Uh, hopefully he's nursing a Guinness uh, this time of night. Uh, can you get the same results in progeria mice with much lower doses of AAV? What's the lowest dose, David, that gives a substantial physiological benefit? I suppose the real question is, what's the multiplicity, what multiplicity of infection is efficacious? Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, one we are uh, working on answering now with a more finely graded uh, dose uh, uh, response set of experiments, as well as uh, treating uh, mice of, of many different ages. Uh, we're doing that in parallel while we take steps to advance the, the work that I presented uh, towards potential clinical application, simply because the need is so great uh, and the rescue, even uh, in the form that, that uh, that I presented uh, was was so strong. Um, the, the short answer is we, we don't know. Even the the tenfold lower dosing that uh, uh, that I, I showed in uh, the progeria slides 
uh, isn't a perfectly controlled experiment because those mice received tenfold lower AAV dose, but were dosed much much younger um, at T3, which corresponds roughly to the first, you know, to a one-year-old toddler in terms of development, at least. Uh, uh, so uh, that's quite different than the, the tenfold higher AAV dosing, uh, which we did at P14, uh, which corresponds in, in maturation level roughly to a five-year-old uh, human. Uh, and the receptors that mediate AAV entry into cells uh, may not have been expressed optimally at P3 in those mice. Um, that's mm -hmm. been an observation of certain kinds of of viruses that show an age-dependent um, tropism or an age-dependent transduction efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I guess all of this is a long-winded way of saying uh, I don't really know the answer to your question, uh, but uh, it's an important question and it's one that we're actively trying to answer now. Yeah. Um, you presented some work, uh, David, just going back to base editing um, on sickle cell disease uh, early on. And uh, I, I did want to uh, uh, give a quick uh, shout out to the uh, cover feature article uh, on the latest issue of the CRISPR journal, uh, which is from your colleagues at Beam Therapeutics, um, in which they introduced uh, the concept and the first designs uh, of inlaid base editors, where the architecture of the base editor, as you presented it, has been somewhat uh, rearranged uh, to provide greater editing flexibility, which they use to introduce the same uh, variant that you briefly touched on, uh, the HB Macassar variant, which is best we can tell is a benign variant. So if you can't switch the sickle cell mutation to the wild type allele, then this would seem to be a perfectly acceptable um, alternative. How useful do you think these IBEs and other um, re-architected re base editors uh, will be in expanding the base editing toolbox. Right, uh, that's a great question. I, um, the work that they presented uh, in that recent paper uh, showing how you could actually integrate a deaminase domain into the architecture of CRISPR-Cas9 uh, was terrific work. It, it, uh, it showed uh, remarkably good performance. It offered advantages on, in terms of editing performance and size. Uh, and, and while a couple of their labs had, uh, had reported uh, efforts to, to integrate deaminases uh, into uh, CRISPR-Cas proteins, I think uh, mm. the results they reported uh, by far had really taken it the farthest and yielded uh, the best results. And, you know, with respect to the, uh, the, the actual edit you referred to, uh, I'm, I'm quite excited about the prospects of directly converting this pathogenic mutation, uh, this mm. uh, glutamate to valine mm. A to T point mutation that mm. underlies uh, almost all cases of the most deadly genetic disease in the world, the most common deadly genetic disease in the world, sickle cell mm. anemia, sickle cell disease, uh, to convert uh, that, that pathogenic mutation into a benign naturally occurring variant. Uh, as mm -hmm. you pointed, it's called hemoglobin Macassar or HBBG. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are already humans naturally uh, born with this mutation, uh, even in hemizygous or homozygous form. And it appears to be benign. Uh, they don't appear to have uh, blood abnormalities. Uh, and so the, the prospect of directly converting the sickle cell mutation into a benign uh, hemoglobin form without making double-stranded breaks, uh, without introducing a variety of indels, indel byproducts at that site, without uh, depending on homology-directed repair, which can be uh, challenging, um, uh, I think really provides a, an exciting potential avenue for a future treatment of, uh, of this very common uh, devastating genetic disease. Yeah, great. Uh, I think we'll have to make this the final question, uh, two-part question. Uh, we just simply up, haven't got the, the bandwidth here to uh, accommodate everybody. Um, hopefully, we can do more do more on prime editing uh, later in the year because um, there's clearly the demand. Um, John asked two questions about prime editing. David, uh, John, as did many others, asked what are the limitations on the insertion size that you can create using prime, edit and, prime editing 
and Alessandro was curious whether you are considering evolving the reverse transcriptase uh, portion of the complex to enhance editing efficiency, maybe using your PACE system. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so uh, the answer to the first question is using the version of prime editing that we've published, we've put in uh, inserts that are up to about 100 nucleotides long. But in um, unpublished work, we have uh, developed some creative uh, prime editing systems that uh, allow much uh, larger insertions. Um, and uh, so uh, hopefully we'll report them uh, at some point this year, assuming we don't all shut down again. That's a good. Uh, and then with respect to the second question, um, uh, yes, we have and are continuing to do exactly that. So uh, as the uh, questioner uh, asked, uh, we have uh, uh, developed a PACE uh, system for prime editing and are using it and have used it to successfully evolve uh, new prime editors, including ones with new uh, reverse transcriptase enzymes that are evolved to have uh, new and in some cases uh, better editing capabilities. Um, so we hope to report that soon as well, and uh, we're pretty excited um, by uh, the growth in the prime editing area, uh, which is a major focus of our lab right now. Of course, of course. Well, that's all the time we have for today's webinar. Uh, today's webcast will be available on demand for repeat viewing. Uh, there was so much in it, and sharing with your colleagues uh, as well. Um, if you want more information on base and prime editing, I do hope you'll check out the latest episode of Guideposts. That's the CRISPR Journal's podcast series, which features my in-depth interview with David, recorded just a few weeks ago. Uh, Guideposts is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and your favorite podcast platform. Uh, we covered much of the ground presented today and a few other topics as well. Our thanks, our sincere thanks to David Liu from Harvard, the Broad, HHMI, and Jessica Madigan from Trilink as well for supporting and speaking on in today's webinar. Uh, the WorkCast team for their uh, great hosting services as always. But most of all, thanks to you uh, for watching uh, in such huge numbers. For everyone at GEN, or GEN as David calls it, and the CRISPR Journal, I'm Kevin Davis. Thank you so much and goodbye for now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kevin.